So, how many of you love to visit fast food restaurants like myself? I know we shouldn't, I know that's bad, I know you see everywhere, every diet fad tells you to stay away from fast food, but um, I love fast food and if I could eat it every day, I would. My wife tells me no because she doesn't want me to spend all of our money, but um, I've come to notice though that as I visited and frequented these fast food restaurants that I've noticed a few things that some of these restaurants that have been around for a long time, they kind of have established themselves recently in the way that they do things. Now, I'm not gonna say these restaurants I mentioned, it's not all, not all, but there's a majority of the times where you might have a similar experience where when I walk into a McDonald's and I walk up to the register, does this happen to anybody else but me? Hello? And you look around, there's one person in the restaurant working the drive-thru, working the fryer, working, putting the hamburgers together, then cleaning the dining room, cleaning the bathrooms. They go, I'll be with you in one second. And there's one person working at McDonald's. Has anybody else encountered that? Now, I know we have someone here who used to work at McDonald's and he would say amen, that's what happened to him. So. McDonald's, they kind of have this reputation where they're going to make their employees do a hundred different things and the customers, you can just wait. I've noticed this about Burger King, especially at this one that closed over here, where me and Big Mike, one of our guys that comes here, we just realized that a lot of times the people at Burger King, I don't think they get enough sleep during the day because a lot of them are just grumpy. And so you have this speaker that's like, welcome to Burger King, I'm going to take your order. And I'm like, can I have a chicken tender? And then we pull around, we pay. And then for whatever reason, I, this always happens at Burger King. Um, can you please go park your car in the front? Or can you pull backwards to the first window and then pull back up? I don't know why we do that. I don't know why we pay, move forward, then back up and move back. But I just do it. I just obey. Like, okay, I, you're in charge. And so... Big Mike and I, we even had a lady who I asked for a Coke. She hands me a fruit punch. I say, hey, this is a fruit punch. I asked for a Coke. And she gets mad. She takes a cup and throws it in our car window. I'm not making this up. And I'm looking. And Big Mike's looking at me like, I don't know what to do. And I'm like, I don't know what's happening either. Like, can you put Coke in it? Like, I don't, I'll take it. Just give it. To so then you have Wendy's. Now, I love Wendy's because I order I pay, I go to the next window, and the bag is already out the window by the time I get I'm like, yes, I'm so excited I drive off. Then I open it up, but see, Wendy's problem is, it's not what I ordered. <laughs> it's like, I want a hamburger, no cheese. I get a chicken with cheese. It's like, what is this? And so they're super fast, but it's not always right. But then there's this company that you walk into this company, and you feel like a king. Or if you're a lady, you feel like a queen. Right? You walk in and every day, everyone there is, how can I serve you today? How can I help you? And they always have like 100 employees behind the counter. I don't know how they fit, but they're all running around like chickens with their heads cut off. But everything is like, can I have a number seven, no cheese, gluten-free bun? Because I'm one of those guys. And they're like, yeah, okay, well, thank you. And they say, my pleasure. Now, they treat you so well that they can tell you things that aren't even true and you just believe it. Because like, you know, you're, you guys spelled more chicken wrong. And they're like, oh, well you know why? Cows wrote that. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah, <laughs> they don't know how to spell. That's true. They, they do, I, I get that. And so this place is amazing because here's what happens. They sat back and they saw fast food industry doing food and they realized that people were just selling burgers to make money and the guy who founded the company said, we want to be more than just a chicken sandwich. We want to provide excellent customer service. We're going to serve the people. Wow, imagine that, that this business is about the people who are coming into their store. They wanted to show people what the love of God looks like and that's serving people and they said, we're going to do something in a new way and because they did something in a new way, I'm going to ask a question and it's going to prove that it works for them. Ready? When is a good time to go to Chick-fil-A? Sunday. It's the only time you won't have a line, but they're closed. But there's no good time. I've tried to hit Chick-fil-A at 11.30, packed. I've tried to go at like 2, where most people are back at work, packed. There is never a good time to go to Chick-fil-A and not face a line, unless, 
All you tech people, jump on board, use the app, do the mobile order, and you'll get your food faster. But they have seen proven results because they said, we're going to do fast food in a new way that nobody has ever done, and we're going to see it make a difference in the world. And in our country, we've seen the difference Chick-fil-A has made because you walk in and you feel like you matter, right? And so in the same way, as we look at the story of God, when we look at redemption, last week Pastor Brian talked about the fall of man and all mankind, men and women, whoever you are, has fallen. And when we get to redemption, we have to look at it that through Christ, God acted in a new revolutionary way than he had operated throughout scripture. He did something entirely new. What was in the Old Testament was temporary. It was a temporary way of him bringing people back to himself. But through Christ, he did something where when Jesus died on Good Friday and he was buried and three days later he resurrected, the world has never been the same. Something revolutionary happened to where thousands of years later, we still talk about it. Thousands of years later, people are wearing crosses. Thousands of years later, people are depicting the crucifixion, and people are mesmerized by this man who died on a cross thousands of years ago. And why are we still talking about it? Because a revolution began the day Jesus died, was buried, and resurrected. God has acted in a new way where through Jesus Christ, everything changed. No longer was the world going to operate the same. No longer would evil have its way. No longer would God's people be spiritually dead. You see, the Apostle Paul says it this way. In the book of Acts, he's giving a sermon. And while he's talking to the people, he makes something. And at first, you're going to be like, Brad, why are you reading that? That's kind of offensive to me. But I want to give you the idea. Let me read it first, and then I'll tell you what the Apostle Paul is saying. He says this. He says, look, you scoffers. Be astounded and perish. And the idea of perish is not like physically die right now. The idea of perish is really mean just go disappear. Like look at it. Those of you that want to mock it, those of you that want to scoff, just disappear because here's why. This is God for I'm doing a work in your days. A work that you will not believe even if one tells it to you. The Apostle Paul is delivering this sermon. He says, look, this is so extraordinary. This is so amazing that if you don't pay attention, you will miss it and you're going to disappear. And Paul is saying this in the middle of his sermon to say this, you need to catch what Jesus Christ did. You need to catch on to the new thing, that this is urgent. You need to realize Jesus is king. He's Lord. Submit to him and you will be a part of his movement. If not, you're going to disappear. You're going to miss the boat. And just like today we see, like it's flooding out here in the streets, there's a flood. This world's not going to be here like this, and we need to be about the boat Jesus is on so we can be a part of his revolution and a part of his movement. And we don't want to miss it. We want to join him in his work. And so we're going to go back to Genesis chapter 3, 15, because for us to understand what Jesus did, we're going to have to make a return to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Pastor Brian said last week that the key to redemption, the key to the story of God is found in verse 15. And this is what it says. This is God speaking to the serpent. He says, I will put enmity. In other words, you could use there as hostility between you and the woman. And between your offspring and her offspring, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. What is going on here? The word for offspring is literally the word seed. And so what God is telling the serpent is this. Your descendants, the people you produce, are going to get into an epic battle against a seed that I am going to bring through Eve. There is going to be an epic cosmic battle where her seed The chosen one, this promised seed, will fight your seed, and this seed will crush your head. And this is a promise that God makes right here in Genesis 3.15. Now, you have to imagine Eve is sitting there listening to God give this promise. And so she's like, ooh, I'm going to have a seed. I'm going to have a child. That's going to be the promised seed. So throughout Scripture, as the writers put the story of God together, they want you to pay attention to this seed to see who could be the one. So the first thing you notice, I put it this way, is we have to pay attention to the story of redemption. 
the story of redemption. In the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians, he says something interesting about Jesus that we have to catch. And a lot of us, we don't catch it. And here's what he says. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in, what does those next four words say? Accordance with the scriptures. And that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with with the scriptures. You guys are smart. What scriptures was Paul talking about? The New Testament or the Old? The Old. So what we have to remember is, Jesus was not a, oh man, my plan's not working. I know, I'm gonna send you Jesus. Jesus, go down and save them. I have a new plan. God's plan from the beginning was to send Jesus Christ. And the Old Testament scriptures point to Jesus doing that. This was not an afterthought for God. This was a beforethought, where before the foundation of the world, he sat back and said, I know how this is going to play out. I'm going to send Jesus, my seed, into the world at the right time to make sure that I can set my people free. And the Old Testament is that story that brings about the chosen seed, the promised seed. And so we have to realize and understand what this story is all about. Y'all with me? So this morning I took Excedrin because I had a headache, so I had a lot of caffeine. And to unpack redemption, we have to talk about the whole entire Bible. So I want you to put on your seatbelts because the caffeine makes me already talk fast and I already talk fast. So if I go too fast, somebody stand up and say slow down. Y'all with me? So here's what's gonna happen. He says, I'm gonna put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. You look at Adam and Eve. Right away, Eve's thinking, ooh, when's this seed coming? I hope it comes soon because I wanna get back to the tree of life. I wanna get back to the garden. I wanna get back to God. So let's hope that this baby comes soon. Adam and Eve have two kids, Cain and Abel. She's like, ooh, this could be the seed. Well, very quickly, what do you see in Scripture? Cain kills Abel. Boom, they're both out of the picture. Well, that escalated quickly. Then you get to Genesis chapter 5, and over and over again, you see all these people. So-and-so lived this amount of years, and he died. So-and-so lived this amount of years, and he died. So-and-so lived this amount of years, and he died. So-and-so lived this amount of years, and he died. So all of those people are not the promised ones. Then you get to Genesis chapter 6, and the whole world's entirely evil, and God says, okay, here's one person, Noah, you're following me faithfully. I'm going to save you, and I'm going to protect my seed who's coming. So I'm going to save you, Noah, you and your family. I'm going to put you on an ark. You're going to float around, even though you're in the desert. You're going to float one day, and I'm going to protect you because I'm going to keep my promised seed alive. So Noah gets in the boat. He's on the boat for 40 days, 40 nights. God saves him. He gets out of the boat. He builds an altar. Yay, God, you're awesome. God, you're great. Then you get to Genesis chapter 9, and he's completely drunk and wasted. So he's not the promised seed. Then you got his two kids, and they're completely not the chosen seed. Then you flash forward to Genesis chapter 11, and all the people of God are like, you know what? We're tired of making God's name great. We're going to build a huge tower so we can make our name great. And that's what sin is in our life anyways, is making our name great, not God's. And so all the world gets together, they build this tower as high to the heavens so they can make their name great, and God's like, I just destroyed everybody. What are you all doing? So he tears the tower down, and he scatters them, confuses the languages, and now all of a sudden it's like, man, where's the promise seed going to come? Because no one is living up to it. Then you get to Genesis chapter 12, and God does something here. He calls out a man named Abram and says, I want you to go to this country where I tell you. And if you just obey me in that, here's what I'm going to do, Abraham. And this is what it says in Genesis chapter 12, verse 2. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great. See how God is making his name great, right? So that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you, catch this, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. God makes a covenant and a promise with Abraham and says, look, through you, Abraham, I'm going to bring my chosen seed into the world. And so as you read the Old Testament, we're always asking the question, who is this seed? Who's going to be the one that comes and lives the right life? the righteous life? Who's going to be the one that is faithful to God? Because through the first 11 chapters, everyone's faithless. 
Everyone's disobedient. You get to Genesis 12, and here, Abraham, you think, okay, maybe Abraham, yeah. And God tells Abraham, Abraham, you and your wife are going to have a kid. And Abraham's like, what, do you know how old my wife is? And you never reveal your age of the wife, but he does. He's like, God, he's like, she's like this old, you know, like, are you sure? And they aren't even patient enough where they bring a child into the world to try to force God's chosen seed to come because they're looking at the world saying, this world's jacked up, we need to make it right, God, so we're just going to force your seed. And God's like, no, that's not how I operate. I'm going to bring my seed at the right time when I think it's ready, when I think it's that moment, and Abraham rushes it, so it's not him. Then he has a son, Isaac, and then God's like, I want you to go kill Isaac, and Abraham's like, what, you promised me a seed, now you want to kill it, God, what are you doing? And then Isaac proves himself not to be the chosen seed. And he has two sons, Jacob and Esau. Esau's angry all the time. Jacob's a deceiver. It's not neither of those two. Then Jacob has 12 sons, and those 12 sons, 11 of them want to kill the other one. So all of a sudden, it's like, what is happening? Like, this is a soap opera that could air, and everyone would be tuned into it. So no one's getting it right. But there is one of those sons of Jacob where God said, through this son, I'm going to do something great. And it's a key for us to pick up on because it gives us a very unique and special characteristic of this one who is to come. And here's what it says in Genesis 49, 8. Judah... Your brothers shall praise you. Your hands shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons shall bow down before you. Catch this. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. So what is this unique characteristic that God has given to Judah? That through him, the promised seed would be a king. He would rule over all people, that all people should have the desire to submit to his king, kingship, because he will rule it with justice. He will rule it with righteousness. He will rule it with love. He will do what is right. Flash forward to King David. The Bible says David was a man after God's own heart. So imagine the people of Israel. We have a king. King Saul was terrible. Why did we appoint him? We have David. David's going to do what's right. And as you're reading scripture, you're like, aha, here's the one. This guy has a heart after God. He's it. Then you read, David goes out on his balcony one day, sees a woman bathing, and says, I want her. Brings her in, even though she's married, commits adultery. Then he commits murder. David's not the chosen seed. And God says, even though you've sinned, someone's going to come on your throne who is going to rule forever. Who's it going to be? Then David has a son, Solomon. King Solomon rises. God gives Solomon, makes him the wisest man to ever have lived and that will ever live. He has knowledge beyond anybody in the entire universe ever. He rebuilds God's temple where God once again dwells with his people. But then Solomon, in all his wisdom, forsakes God's wisdom chooses his own and falls into idolatry and worships foreign gods. Solomon's not the one. He's not the promised seed who is to come. The seed hasn't arisen yet. And all throughout the rest of scripture, all throughout the prophets, you see them speaking of this one who is to come, this king who would come and would rule with justice and righteousness. And by the time you get to the end of the Old Testament, Here are two great questions to ask. One, is anyone going to get this right? And two, when is the seed coming? And this is exactly where you find Israel in between the time the Old Testament was finished and waiting for the Messiah. When is this seed coming? This world is jacked up. There is evil and wickedness and death that is ruling in this world. When is God going to make it right? From the beginning, God had called his people to rule over his creation and reflecting praise and glory back to God. But instead of that happening, what's ruling in the world? Sin, death, and idols. God's plan for his people has been distorted. It's been interrupted. But God would not leave us in that state. 
the love of God and the compassion of God and the grace of God did not tell him. He didn't sit back and go, that's it, they've messed it up. I'm finished with those people. No, 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 no. Despite man's faithlessness, God remained faithful to his promise that he would make a way for us to return to the garden. And it's easy for us as we read the scriptures to sit back and shake our heads at Israel and say, man, you guys messed it up so bad, I wouldn't have done that if that was me. But the writers of the Old Testament want us to realize that as we look at what Israel does, we need to see ourselves in that same position as them. We've all been faithless towards God. We've all had moments in our time where we say, God, our own wisdom is better than yours. God, I know you shouldn't say I, I, I shouldn't have pride, but you know what? I have to have pride because if I don't have pride, who's going to have pride for me? And you get into sin. And we forsake God's wisdom for our own. We've all had moments in our time where we could have been worshiping money, could have been worshiping sex, could have been pornography, could have been alcohol, could have been drugs, could have been adultery, could have been bitterness, could have been materialism, whatever it is. We've all had moments where we say, God, your way is better than, our way is better than yours. And we've been in the same boat as Israel. And as we read these scriptures and as we look at what redemption is, how is God going to make the world right And a better question, more personal question, is how is God going to make me right? How do I get back to the Father? How do I get back to the garden? How do I find access to the tree of life? And this leads us to the next part in our message this morning. Not only do we need to understand the story of redemption, that what God had promised to do in the Old Testament scriptures We need to know the work of redemption that Jesus actually accomplished. Because everything changed through his death, his burial, and his resurrection. What did Jesus accomplish through his resurrection? Jesus is the promised seed. He is the ruler that was to come. He is the one who rules with justice and righteousness. He is the one who rules as a shepherd, protecting and loving his flock and feeding his flock, that he is the one who God had promised from the very beginning of Scripture who was to come. He is the king of the world. And when we speak of redemption, we have to know what we are speaking of. Redemption is a word that is closely connected to the idea of slavery, That when you use the word redemption, it literally has this idea. When someone was a slave, you could purchase a slave's freedom by paying a ransom. And when you paid that ransom, that slave was no longer a slave, but now had been set free to live however they wanted to live. Now, I'm not saying that God rescues us to live however we want to live. But the idea is this, is that throughout Scripture you see Adam and Eve sinned, they turned to idols, God kicks them out of the garden, puts them into exile, and they are now slaves to their idols, they're slaves to sin, and they're slaves to their bondage of, of slavery here. And redemption is all about the idea where God pays a ransom, takes us from slavery to freedom, takes us from death to to life, takes us from exile back to the garden, back to the tree of life. And so as you read all throughout the Old Testament scriptures, you'll see Israel talk about the idea of being in bondage to Egypt, even though they're not enslaved in Egypt. Why are they always making a reference to Egypt? It's about them being stuck in slavery, in bondage, and not just physically in their real world life, it's spiritually they're stuck in bondage. They're stuck in this place of death. So what did God do through the redemption? What did God have to tackle to set us free from our idolatry? Romans 1, 21 through 23 says this is, for us to be set free from our idolatry, we have to, he had to deal with our, our idolatry, excuse me. It says this, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God 
or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. Paul uses this imagery here to bring us back to the garden. Adam and Eve, when they partake of the forbidden fruit, thought they were being wise in their own eyes. And they traded the wisdom of God for the wisdom of the world. And instead of becoming wise, look what it says, they became fools. And then they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for the images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. See, all of us, the moment we are conceived, we always want to exchange the glory of God for the things this world has to offer. Sex is better than God. Pornography is better than God. Lying is better than God. Being dishonest is better than God. Not being faithful at my job is better than God. And we're stuck in our idols. Instead of God ruling over our lives, instead of God, us operating under his guidance and his leading, we've turned to idols, and now our idols control us. You ever had a place in your life where you felt like you were stuck under an idol that you could not get away from? I know when I was 18, I had idols in my life, sex, drugs, and pride, and anger. And God had to bring me from death to life, from slave to free, and it took an act of God where it was not something within myself. It was not something I could do. Left to myself, I struggled with those sins, with those idols. And those idols were going nowhere. They controlled me. They controlled where I went. They controlled what I did. They controlled who I hung out with. It controlled the bad thoughts I felt about myself where how come I always feel less than what I should be? And it took the act of God to say, Brad, this is not who I created you to be. And God broke the idols in my life. And redemption is about breaking the powers of your idols. Because left to ourselves, look at the Old Testament, they couldn't break the idols. And that's the point that the Old Testament is bringing up is, with man, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. This is how people are created new, because it took the work of Christ to defeat the powers of idols in our lives. So how do we get access to God? How will we return to the tree of life? It's Jesus' work of redemption. Colossians 2.13 says of this one, I love this verse, because I think even as, as us believers who Christ has already set free, idols can creep their nasty, sneaky, snaky head into our lives and can begin to cause us to believe that these idols have power over us. But I want you to catch what Paul says. And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him. Catch this. Having forgiven us all our trespasses. How's that? By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross, he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection defeated sin and death and idolatry once and for all. But see, many times as the people of God, we sit back and say, well, this thing's in my life I know I've said this. You might have heard people say, well, you know, I just have an anger problem. That's just who I am. That's how I'm always going to be. No, that is not what the power of Christ does in you and through you. That Christ, through his death, burial, and resurrection, he defeated every single power that holds us into bondage. We are no longer slaves through Christ's redemption. We have a new king. We have a new spirit that is within us that says, you are my child. In me, you are free. You are called my child. These idols no longer have a hold or a grasp. And this is why the Apostle Paul and the disciples were so urgent to share their message because there's so many people, and you know them, 
who are stuck in their sins. Sometimes we could say, I, I just can't believe that these people would commit these horrible acts. I just can't believe people would be stuck into drugs. I just can't believe that people would do all these things. You know why they're doing that? They're stuck under their idols. They don't know any better. And we, as God's church, we have a command. We have the best news. And what do we do? Jesus loves me, this I know. We sit on the greatest news, the only news that matters in this world, the revelation, revolutionary news where people can realize that no matter how bad you've messed up, the worst mistake you ever made, Jesus loves you. That that biggest mistake, your biggest bondage, your biggest chain, Jesus came to break the change once and for all. Jesus is not just the idea he's king. Jesus is king, whether people believe it or not. And I want you to catch this. The biggest thing that the world had to bring against Jesus and against us, the enemy's biggest weapon is to threaten us with death. If you don't fall in line, we will kill you. During this time when Paul was preaching these sermons, for him to say Jesus is Lord was a direct statement to Caesar and the emperor that he is not Lord. Because he's not. Jesus is Lord. And if you remember, Jesus is standing before Pilate. And Pilate looks at Jesus and says, don't you know that I have the power to set you free? If you would just stop proclaiming to be the king of the Jews, I will let you live. But if you don't, I'm going to have to kill you. See, the whole point of crucifixion is this, to show people who's in charge. If people revolted against the Roman Empire, you know what they did? Took those who revolted crucified them, they'd make a path miles long where they would put people on post. So as people were walking to that city, they'd see rotting, dying, people in agony and pain. Why did they do that? So it would show them, you know who's in charge? Caesar is, because he will kill you. If you don't do what he says, death will come to you. And the greatest weapon that the world has to offer and what they did to Jesus, they killed him. Romans, yeah, this annoying guy is out of the way. The religious Jews, yes, the annoying guy is out of the way. We stopped it. Then three days later, Jesus pulled the greatest okie doke in the world and rose from the dead, victorious. Amen? And he proved to them, Satan, I just crushed your head. Because now my kingdom is coming into the world, and my kingdom will not be stopped. Not even the gates of hell will prevail against this kingdom. It is going to grow. Oh, yes, it will start small, but it is going to grow, and you have lost ground. Today, you have been defeated, and God has entrusted us with this message of redemption. And for each of us, this is what Ezekiel 37 is talking about, because you have the Valley of Dry Bones. You guys might have heard this story. And there's the imagery where Israel was sitting back saying, ah, we're doomed. All hope is lost. We're not living in the land with God. We don't have access to God. God's not with us. We're abandoned. We're not even in the land. In fact, we've been cut off from everything. We've been cut off from God. We've been cut off from the garden. We've been cut off from the promises of God. We're dead. And God speaks a word to them. I want you to catch what God says. He says, I will raise you from your graves. I will bring you into the land. I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live. And I will place you in the land. And what land is that? The land where God dwells. You see, man is incapable of gaining access to God on their own. It takes God to breathe life into our bones. 
It takes God's breath and him putting his spirit inside of us. When he places his spirit inside of us, we begin to live in a new way, in a revolutionary way where we begin to live for God and we begin to experience access to the Father that can only come through this act of redemption. And through our faith in Jesus Christ, we can sit back and say, we are no longer slaves to sin. We are a new creation. This is why the apostle John, when he starts his letter, he says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And a few verses later in 14, he says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Why does John start his letter in the beginning? Because he's telling us, just like Genesis 1, in the beginning where you have the work and creation story, God's done a new creation. God's done a new work. And that's why Paul can say, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed. Behold, all things have become new. Not only does God defeat the powers of our idols and set us free from sin and give us forgiveness of sins, but his redemption and our redemption has restored our vocation, our purpose, our functions. See, for a lot of times, for a lot of years, we sat back and said, here's what Christianity is all about. Make sure you get your get out of hell free card. Just get saved, and then we're all going to wait. We're all going to gather here, and we're going to wait for, for God to come and take us all to heaven. And we sat back and just bring everybody here. Let's all just get saved. And that's what church world became about. But God's plan for our lives was way bigger than just sitting on a cloud and a diaper and a harp. That's not why God created us. That's not why Psalm 8 says that God created us just a little lower than himself and gave us glory and honor. It wasn't just to sit in heaven. It was to be a kingdom of priests in his world, ruling over his creation under his care, his guidance, and his leading, and then telling all of humanity, look how great our God is. Look how loving our God is. Look at him. But for so long, we've taken this reflection, and instead of reflecting God to the world, we just reflected death and sin to the world. But in redemption, Christ returns us to our purpose. Well, how do I know that? Look at Revelation, the very last book of the Bible. Revelation 5, 9 says this, talking about Jesus, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed redemption people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, catch this, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign in heaven. No, oh, and they shall reign on the earth. You see, Paul says, until we take our last breath, we are not present with the Lord where he is, where he dwells. He is in us, his spirit's within us, and he's moving. But until we take our last breath, we have a purpose. And that purpose is to be a kingdom of priests. That every one of us who have faith in Jesus Christ, our role is not just to sit back and say, I'm blessed to be at church, and then don't ever engage the world. Our mission is exactly the same as Christ. And in Christ, when he creates us new, he brings us into his mission. And when he went out, look at who he went to. Jesus said, I didn't come to go to the healthy people. I'm not going to go to the people who think they have their life all together. What I'm going to do is I'm going to spend time with the crooked tax collector I'm going to eat at your house today. I'm going to go to the people who are the worst of the worst sinners. I'm going to eat with them. Why? Because I'm telling them about the kingdom. I'm telling them that they can be set free. Our same responsibility should be the exact same as Christ, to go to these lost people, no matter who they are, where they're from, what country, no matter what. Our goal is to tell everyone that you can be created new in Jesus Christ, that God is putting the world back right, and God can put you back right if you put your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. 
This is the mission that God has restored. This is the purpose for our lives. A lot of times Christians say, I don't know what God wants me to do. Yes, you do. It's to tell people about God's kingdom. Just start doing that with your neighbors, your coworkers. If someone's cutting your hair, hey, do you go to church? Begin those conversations with people because this is a revolutionary news. It's called the good news for a reason because Christ will set people free from their sins, from death, and from idolatry. You see, the story of God is a love story. We are his image bearers sharing in his world. We messed it up. And so God came himself as a human, the true Israelite, and did for us what we couldn't do for ourselves in and through Jesus. He rescued us from idolatry, enabled us to worship and know God our Father, and has given us the ability to reflect praise and glory of God to the entire world. And that's what it means to be a royal priesthood. And this was all accomplished through Jesus' work of redemption. And so today, I want to leave this with you. If you've never sat back and said, if you find your place saying, I'm not a part of this new creation. I've never jumped on board with what God is doing in the world. I challenge you today, join him. Allow him to change you and make you new. Allow him to make you right. Allow him to bring you back to the garden, back to the tree of life, so you can finally have victory in your life over those idols that have enslaved you for so long. So today, Jesus is asking, We're asking as all the church leaders here, if you have never given your life to Christ, would today be the day that you consider joining him? Would today be the day that you say, Jesus, you are my Lord and Savior, I follow you. Would today be the day that you allow him to set you free from the bondage to sin and your idols? Because like the Apostle Paul said, you don't want to miss out that if you've never tasted the freedom that God has for you, it is glorious, it is beautiful, it restores hope, it restores life, it restores purpose. It's not easy, doesn't mean believing in him, your life's gonna be perfect. But when Christ is in your life, you realize in those moments where life is tough, You're not giving up because your father has never once given up on you and he will be faithful to complete the work that he began in you. So today you might say, well, Brad, how how do I join God in his movement? Number one, it's you crying out to God and saying, God, I trust your son Jesus as my savior. Change me. I can't do it on my own and begin to follow him. You can do that right where you're sitting. In just a moment, the worship team is gonna come up and lead us in a song. Or you can come down, we're gonna have deacons and elders down front. And you can come and talk to one of us and pull us aside, pull someone aside that you might know and say, how can I become a new creation? Because you don't want to miss out on what God is doing. Let's join him in what he's doing in the world. Because how is the world going to experience God's love? It's through God making us right first and then us living for him. I want you to bow your, your hearts with me. Father God, we thank you that you have always been faithful from the beginning, that you saw our disobedience You saw us stuck in our idols. And Father, you made a way for us to come back to you. You didn't have to do it, Father. We don't deserve it, Father. But you love us that much that you were willing to sacrifice your one and only son so that he would conquer sin and death forevermore. Father, I pray for those of us in here this morning that have never trusted you as our Lord and Savior. Father God, I pray today 
would be the day that they give their lives to you, that they realize they can't do it within themselves, that they need your love and grace to make them new. Do what only you can do. It's in your powerful name we pray.